Year eight, this is the second week of Oscar Wilde's A The Picture of Dorian Gray. Uh, I'm sorry that Miss Street has asked me to fill in. I'm sorry for you, but I'm happy for me because it, this really is an extraordinary novel by an extraordinary playwright. Um, so let's recap on a few things. Could you tell me what sin is, first of all? Does anyone remember? Sin, it's Latin for without. What is it in more common parlance? Uh, sin basically means a turning away from God. In brief terms, it means evil. Um, if you are in a state of sin, you're without grace, you are without God's sympathy. But how did John Proctor sin? If you remember the, um, the play The Crucible from uh, many months ago. How did John Proctor sin? I remember his wife was un upset but loyal because John had had an affair with his one of his neighbours, Abigail. So, thou shalt not commit adultery is one of the seven sins. Um, or oh, adultery is one of the seven sins. Hedonism then, last lesson, what does that mean? You've forgotten it means you are living for pleasure and how might hedonism affect a young man so let's think about the physical and psychological effects of hedonism so first if you're hedonistic you live for pleasure you might drink a lot of alcohol you might stay up late you might have, have a lot of affairs um, you might eat a lot if you like how, do, how might it affect you let's look at social let's look at your reputation well you could um, uh, Dorian Gray is actually um, refused entry to a lot of parties. Women leave the room when he enters because he, by the end of the novel and the chapter we are about to read, has had such uh, a corrupting influence on the young women of town, around town. Um, so he would have had affairs with them and, and, and left them alone. Um, therefore spoiling their reputation among other men. Um, you could also drink a lot and spoil your body, uh, become dehydrated, unhealthy, fat. Uh, some new words then, Faust and super, uh, surreptitious. Surreptitious means something done without being observed, so secretive if you like. And a Faust, pause the video if you need more time, a Faust, this is a very clever expression which we're going to go into in some detail shortly. A Faust is a legendary German protagonist who exchanged his soul for infinite pleasures. Does it remind you of anyone? Someone who exchanged their soul for infinite pleasures? Remember, at the end of chapter two, I touched on this in my illustration, but Dorian wishes the painting Basil created could age and Dorian keep his looks forever. The wish comes true, basically. Today we're going to look at chapter 13, and in a similar way to when we last met, make some notes. Uh, so, let's look at this chapter Faust then. Oh no, before then, let's go back. So, why did Oscar Wilde need to be surreptitious with some of his relationships? Remember, we discussed Oscar Wilde being renowned or being infamous because of uh, some relationships he had. He was jailed in particular for, for one relationship with Alfred Lord Douglas. Um, and how does hedonism link to sin? If you want some clues to the answers of those, to those, then rewind the video about two, uh, a minute or two. This is the story of a German scientist who decided he wants to know instantly all the secrets of the universe and have all the pleasures of the universe and he, s he gives his soul to a devilish character called Mephistopheles uh, in exchange for all worldly pleasures. We're going to look at some quotations and ask ourselves how is a pi the picture of Dorian Gray a Faustian novel? Then I'm going to ask you to write about fear and tension in chapter 13. Here's Faust, a uh, German scientist. There's a chap called Mephistopheles in the background, and he promises to give Faust access to all the pleasures that a tired old man would want to live, as embodied in the young lady on the top left. 
So they both together seduce a woman called Margaret, break her heart, just as Dorian Gray does to a, a, a girl, a young actress called Stigal Vane. And Faust feels terribly guilty about it, yet they carry on experiencing all worldly pleasures of knowledge. There's another image of Mephistopheles. This he comes, uh, he dresses well. Um, these seductive characters are usually framed in fine coats, uh, velvet, and the two of them uh, take part in this seduction of Margaret. So he embodies everything that's uh, vivacious, happy, jolly, attractive, and worldly, that's to say, are uh, open to all worldly pleasure. Uh, here is a statue somewhere in Germany. Something's blocking my screen, but it's a censor seen in something of Goethe's, something rather, Mephisto, Mephistopheles, um, and it's the Mephistopheles, it's actually Versicht or something. Mephist Mephistopheles seduces his student. There's Faust, the tired old man, who's going to be a lot happier, but ultimately he's going to lose his soul. So let's summarize the story of Faust. Uh, God says to Mephistopheles, do you know this chap called Faust? And God says, he's my servant, which means he's a loyal person. Um, Dorian Gray, in the story, only says that religion is interesting because it looks pretty, but it's ultimately boring. Mephistopheles says, yes, he serves you in a particular manner, there's no earthly food or drink at that fool's dinner, which means Faust is well behaved, he doesn't drink much wine, he has a good self-denying diet. He uh, mortifies his soul, if you like, which means he likes to restrain his appetites. Mephistopheles bets God that he, that Mephistopheles could take Faust's soul. I might win him, I might win his soul. Then Mephistopheles complains, I've done philosophy, I've finished law, theology, I've taken fierce pains from end to end, but I'm no wiser than I was before. So Faust says, what's the worth, what's, what's the point in spending all this effort when there's still so much to learn? Um, a scientist might think this about space. He might sell his soul to learn about all the secrets of the universe. It's a very tempting idea for Faust. Uh, at a very basic level, it's I suppose it's the the idea of whether or not you want to cheat in your homework, have instant success, or take the hard route to success. But look at the similarities. Suddenly there had come across. Suddenly there had come someone in his life, Dorian's life, who seemed to have disclosed to him life's mystery. Let's look at the similarities between them, between. Lord Henry and uh, and and Mephistopheles, someone who can disclose to him life's mysteries. Faust says, I'm no wiser than before. Lord Henry says, I can make you wise. I can disclose the mystery of beauty. Um, so Faust, gazing at the symbol, how each to the whole world itself was gives one in another works and lives, how heavenly forces fall and rise, golden vessels pass each other by. 450 is just the line number, so ignore these numbers where I've accidentally left them in. Um, so remember, Lord Henry says, don't squander the gold of your days. That's the instruction. Mephistopheles, my friend, you'll win more for your senses in an hour than in a whole year's monotony what the tender spirits sing, the lovely pictures they bring. So you are going to feed your senses more in an hour than you would have done in your entire life for a whole year. Uh, look at how Mephistopheles talks about the senses, pleasing the senses, and now look at Lord Henry saying, the secret of life is to cure the soul by means of the senses. Interestingly, Oscar Wilde himself said that the church cured him from his degeneracies 
The artistic side of the church and its fragrance and delicacies would have cured my degeneracies. He wrote to a journalist, or he said to a journalist. So the incense, um, the music, the chanting, the bells, the, the tapestries and some paintings would have been a cure to him because his soul, his senses would have been at ease. So this is one way that Dorian Gray is a Faust. It's the idea of pleasing your senses that he covers. Um, Faust complains, abstain, which means deny. What can the world bring me again? Abstain, you shall, you must abstain. That's you. That's the eternal song. So he grumbles that uh, religion is restricting, restraining his appetites. Um, Mephistopheles says in bold, I mean to show you what no man has seen. Basically, one of the great secrets of life, or one of the mysteries of life. Mephistopheles, could we argue that he represents, well, who? Anyone? Who do you think Mephistopheles is representing? I mean to show you what no man has seen. Who and Dorian Gray? Dorian, Basil, Lord Henry? Lord Henry, I think. Uh, suddenly there had come someone across his life who seemed to disclose life's mysteries. He's looked at that already. So, Faust says, yep, go for it. Snare me with luxury, entrap me with luxury. Let that be the last day I see. I'll give you my soul in return. Mephistopheles says, done. Go and seduce and learn about all sorts of things. Um, Dorian Gray buys, uh, he buys several literature books. He buys, he studies perfume, he travels, he has, he owns about three homes and has parties and has musical concerts with strange instruments, gets involved in embroidery, basically learns, studies and buys everything he wants to. Uh, he adds modes by which he could escape, it's called. Um, yes, there was a, uh, and I touched on the book called Aribur, which is about a character who leaves Paris for a home which he decorates purely to please his senses. Um, so, if it were I who was to be always young and the picture was to grow old, for that, for that I was good, give everything. This is Dorian Gray at the end of chapter two. I would give everything if the picture could age. There's nothing in the world that I would not give. I would give my soul for it. Who does that remind you of? Who's Dorian Gray reminding you of here? I would give my soul to always be young. Something that no man has seen. Who does it remind you of? Yes, Faust. Uh, so Mephistopheles says, do as you wish. There's no measure, there's no limit. Nibble at everything, feast on everything. Notice how pleasure is associated with ingesting things, tasting, eating. Catch all fragments while you're flying. Enjoy it all. Enjoy it all? Who does that remind you of? Marie, I think. Remember, don't squander the gold of your youth. Live while you can. Don't waste your lilies and roses. Enjoy it. Um, art is long. Time is short. Art is long. Remember the idea of the aesthete who believed that you should live for pleasure, you should live for creating art. La, pour la, for art for art's sake. Uh, interestingly, uh, when Dorian Gray kills Basil, he does later, um, he takes out a book to relax, uh, and that book is written by Gautier, who wrote this phrase, art for art's sake, he invented it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so live the wonderful life that's in you, let nothing be lost upon you, be always searching for new sensations, be afraid of nothing, says Lord Henry, nibble at everything, enjoy it all, what are the similarities between these two? Be always searching for new sensations, live, live, enjoy it all, we can see the similarities. Uh, so basically Faust, uh, dies, he gives his soul, he's taken down to hell. Uh, he realises, I sped through the world that's there, gripped by the hair, every appetite. But um, on the last line, he says, why does he need to roam eternity? Men don't really need to know everything. 
feeling a bit guilty about what he did to Margaret. Great, important story. So, uh, subheading, please, could you write, to what extent is the picture of Dorian Gray a Faustian tale? So please write this down, underline it. To what extent is the picture of Dorian Gray a Faustian tale? Okay, so a lot of you out there thinking that's quite a hard question to answer. I've given you a frame, actually. There are many similarities between Faust and the picture of Dorian Gray. For example, if you're happy enough to continue write, writing that, rewind the video and push on. But if you want, then stay with me. Uh, I've given you the first half of the answer. Firstly, Mephistopheles urges Faust to enjoy it all. This evokes the wisdom of Lord Henry, who urges Dorian to... So what's Lord Henry's version of enjoy it all? So that's the first part of the lesson done. To what extent is the picture of Dorian Gray a Faustian tale? Um, well, I'm afraid I can't wait for you to write the answer down. Pause the video for a moment. We'll push on to the second half. Uh, we're going to read chapter 13. I'm going to jump out of PowerPoint, make some notes with you. We'll read it in three sections. Uh, keywords, parody, comic imitation, ignoble, shameful, satire means mockery, satire, which is a half man, half goat, I think, it's a mythical, ugly creature, uh, threadbare means worn, leprosy is a disease, uh, uh, there's some laburnum from last lesson. Uh, so, by the way, does anyone know what happens to Dorian's soul? So, yes, Youth had spoiled him by the end of the novel. That's the idea that living as if he's a young man has destroyed his reputation. That hedonistic lifestyle has caused him social embarrassment and, um, and disgrace. And guilt as well. Uh, he tarnished himself, so he feels as if he, has, he could have been better. When we meet him now, he is going to be... Yeah, he's, going, he's carrying a lot of regrets. He felt a longing for the unstained purity of his boyhood. I have a star, which means I need to look at something else. What do I need to look at? Uh, okay. The idea of the unstained purity of his boyhood. Oscar Wilde had an affair with a young man called Lord Alfred Douglas. Um, I suppose it wasn't unusual, but it was illegal to have intimate relationships with men. And um, unfortunately for Wilde, Lord Alfred has dug or Lord Alfred Douglas's father was the Earl of Shaftesbury, uh, who had him arrested into jail for two years in Reading. Um, but he wrote, Oscar Wilde wrote from jail to his former boyfriend and said, um, urged him not to pretend. He said, Lord Douglas, don't pretend that you are this unstained, um, innocent boy, the morning dawn of boyhood with its delicate bloom, its clear blue light, its joy of innocence and expectation, you, my friend, had left far behind. So you're no longer the, the clear, you no longer shine with the clear, pure light of boyhood or innocence. You've left that far behind. So here's a quotation from Dorian Gray. He felt a longing for the unstained purity of his boyhood. So it's, the, it's this idea that sin stains, tarnishes, damages your soul. And the painting that Dorian Gray's by now hidden away is damaged because it reflects his own misbehavior and his sin. Uh, they say he sold his soul for a pretty face, says a, an old woman. Um, really, it's implied she's a prostitute uh, who says that I know Dorian Gray. He comes around these parts a lot of, uh, uh, of often. Uh, I should say he uh, he visits these parts often and um they say he sold his soul for a pretty face so that dorian gray is known in very re disreputable parts yet he manages to walk around as if he's unstained unspotted uh innocent let's uh so could we have a subheading and how does wild create fear and tension in this scene um, so if you're in one of the higher sets, I suggest you write this question down. If you're one of my students, I suggest list examples of fear and tension in this scene. So my people, please list examples of fear and tension in the scene. I'm going to give you a list of 
things it's actually the same as I'm going I'm giving to the other cast awesome. but if you're if you're Miss Street or whoever else teaches year eight class then how does Wild create fear and tension in the scene uh, so I will need a P uh, they'll want paragraphs I suppose so we're going to look for gothic tropes which means gothic uh, themes techniques darkness a tone of discomfort tone is where do you know what tone is let me ring tone or a um, tone in music tone in literature is where a writer shares the feelings of a narrator with the writer so it's it's worth to give you a feeling so tone of discomfort similar to atmosphere i suppose surreptitious actions you know what surreptitious should, do you remember what surreptitious means yeah those secretive actions symbolism pathetic fantasy basically you referring to the weather and adjectives descriptive well, okay, 20 minutes, so let's try and fly through scene one. Scene one is about suspense. Scene two is the revelation. And we're going to read the third section. My apologies, this should say number three. The third section, recognition. So I'm going to pause after each of these sections. And let's fly over now to words. No, that let's fly over to work properly. Uh, let's enlarge word. Let's read. Okay. Um, okay. So chapter three, th chapter thirteen. This is exactly how you would see it. I have been unable to add line numbers without crashing my computer, so I haven't bothered. He passed out of the room and began the ascent. Basil following close behind. They walked softly as men do instinctively at night. The lamp cast fantastic shadows wall the staircase. A rising wind made some of the windows rattle. I've highlighted some words I urge you to highlight as we go along as well. I'll come back and make some comments. Um, so Basil is about to be shown Dorian's secret in the attic. Basil at this stage is on his way to Paris for an art exhibition. Uh, when they reached the top landing, Dorian set the lamp down on the floor and taking out the key, turned it in the lock. You insist on knowing, Basil. Basically, you insist on knowing my secret, Basil, he asked in a low voice. Yes. I'm delighted, he answered, smiling. Then he added somewhat harshly, you're the one man in the world who is entitled to know everything about me. You've had more to do with my life than you think. And taking up a lamp, he opened the door and went in. Under my mist pop. A cold current of air passed him, and the light shot up for a moment in the flame of murky orange. He shuddered. Shut the door behind you, he whispered, as he placed the lamp on the table. Hallward glanced round him with a puzzled expression. The room looked as if it had not been lived in for years. A faded Flemish tapestry, a curtain picture, an old Italian cassone. Uh, a cassone is a chest and an almost empty bookcase that was all that was all that it seemed to contain besides a chair and a table as dorian gray was lighting a half-burnt candle that was standing on the mantel shelf he saw the whole place covered with dust and that the carpet was in holes a mouse ran scuffling behind the wainscoting which means paneling on the wall there was a damp odor of mildew so you think that it's only god who sees the soul basil Draw that curtain back and you'll see mine. The voice that spoke was cold and cruel. You're mad, Dorian. You're playing a part. Muffled, muttered Hallward, frowning. You won't, then I must do it myself, said the young man, and he tore the curtain from its rod and flung it on the ground. So there ends section one. Let's make some notes then. Rising winds. Where are my notes? Okay, rising wind. I like this idea of pathetic fantasy. It's almost symbolic of the tension that is being created. So actually, I don't need a new comment, do I? Let's add it here. Uh, I forget what it is. Delete, delete. Let's work on this one. Uh, so yeah, it's pathetic fantasy. It almost serves as a warning to Basil that something. That is about to happen. Pathetic fantasy 
creating, let's say, creating suspense, warning, perhaps. So add notes with me as we go along. So pathetic fallacy creating suspense or warnings. A rising wind makes some of the windows rattle. Uh, you call us also out a tone of discomfort to windows rattling, I suppose. So a cold current of air passed between them. What can we say about this? Well, this creates a tone of discomfort. It's almost it's also symbolic, if you like. People talk about having a cold heart, don't they? Or you're cold, you're soulless. Now Dorian's attic door has been opened. This cold air rushes out. It's almost a ghostly air. They say that when anyone ever ex experienced a ghost, they say that the, the temperature in a room drops. So let's say ghostly, soulless presence within. It's a touch of symbolism. It's almost... evil in, inside. So uh, Hallward glanced around him. The room looked as if it had been... Look at how in this sentence we have faded, damp, old, also I think threadbare, covered with dust, uh, carpet in holes. This is a vernacular. This is a series of words we don't usually associate with uh, Dorian Gray. He's usually immaculate. He is usually well dressed, but this neglected, faded, unkempt atmosphere is really what's happening inside Dorian's soul. He has neglected his soul. So it's symbolic. Dorian's soul. neglected his prayers, he's neglected his uh, sleep, his being polite, being respectful towards people. And the painting reflects his, that inner, that inner dampness, if you like, that inner sense that, uh, that he's, that inner decay. He's described as the voice, being cold and cruel, not Dorian, it's, he's almost unrecognisable by being described as a voice. This is the voice. So let's call him cold and cruel. Um, this is an adjective. He's now a fearful person, cold and cruel. So it's it's creating, it's adding to that tone of discomfort. The cruel man presiding over this faded, tattered empire. This is the real Dorian, but the one, the public face of Dorian Gray is the one that's once polite. Uh, he tore the curtain. This is a, uh, this is a, it's really a, it adds a tone of violence, doesn't it? Fear and tension. I think if you hear suddenly suddenly fearful moment where Dorian says, well, if you won't open the curtain, that curtain covering the paint portrait, then I'll tear it away. So Dorian's suddenly losing control, or at least portraying a more vicious side. Uh, I suggest we, we have time, I think, to read one more section. I'll save section three for another time. An exclamation of horror broke from the painter's lips as he saw in the dim light the hideous face on the canvas, canvas grinning at him. There was something in expression that filled him with disgust and loathing. Good heavens, it was Dorian Gray's own face he was looking at, the horror, whatever it was, but not yet entirely spoiled that marvellous beauty. There was still some gold in the thinning hair. Gold! Ladies and gentlemen, can we remember who calls beauty gold? Do you remember who said don't squander the gold of your days. Anyone, can I hear you? Don't squander the gold of your days. Did someone say Lord Henry? You're absolutely right. Uh, there was still some gold in the thinning hair. So even though Dorian Gray looks ugly, there's still some gold in the thinning hair and some scarlet in the sensual mouth. 
The sodden eyes had kept something of the loveliness of their blue. The noble curves had not yet completely passed away from chiseled nostrils and from plastic throat. Uh, it's quite impressive, those plastic in Victorian times. Uh, there, yes, it was Dorian himself. But who'd done it? He seemed to recognise his own brushwork, and the frame was his own design. The idea was monstrous, yet he felt afraid. He seized the lighted candle and held it to the picture. In the left-hand corner was his own name, Basil, traced in long letters of bright vermilion, which is a sort of greeny-blue. It was some foul parody. Do you know what parody means? An imitation. It was some foul parody, some infamous, ignoble satire. Remember, infamous means uh, famous for bad things, ignoble, shameful. He had never done that. Still, it was his own. It was his own picture. He knew it, and he felt as if his blood had changed in a moment from fire to sluggish ice. His own picture. What did it mean? Why did it alter? He turned and looked at Dorian Gray with the eyes of a sick man. His mouth twitched, and his parched tongue seemed unable to articulate. I should have hide. I wanted to be parched. He won't let me. We'll do it later. Uh, he passed his hand across his forehead. It was dank with clammy sweat. The young man was leaning against the mantel shelf. This is a story now. Watching him with that strange expression that one sees on the faces of those who are absorbed in a play when some great artist is acting. There was neither real sorrow in it nor real joy. There was simply the passion of the spectator, with perhaps a flicker of triumph in his eyes. He'd taken a flower out of his coat and was smelling it, or pretending to do so. What does this mean? cried Orwood at last. His own voice sounded shrill and curious in his ears. Years ago, when I was a boy, said Dorian Gray, crushing the flower in his hand, you met me, flattered me, and taught me to be vain of my good looks. Flattered me could be a euphemism, uh, again, but we don't really need to explore that today. Uh, taught me to be vain of my good looks. One day you introduced me to a friend of yours who explained to me the wonder of youth. What is that German play where somebody explains the wonder, the mysteries of the world? Anyone? What's the name of that German play beginning with F? Faust. Explain to me the wonder of youth, and you finished a portrait of me that revealed to me the wonder of beauty in a mad moment that, even now I don't know whether I regret or not, I made a wish. Perhaps you could call it a prayer, basically that the, the play, the painting ages and he doesn't let's annotate scene two then i'll leave you alone uh filled him with disgust and loathing so let's have a tone of discomfort there's some gothic words here as well as so um there's something about darkness um the horror whatever it was is not yet inside entirely spoiled that marvelous beauty there was still some gold in the thinning hair now, don't squander the gold of your days. Let's just, for your own reference, let's say this evokes evocative of Lord Henry. Um, yes, thank you. So the idea down here, the idea is monstrous, yet he felt afraid, fear and tension. Sharing, it's a it's a tone of discomfort as well. Your it's the narrator sharing the feeling of a character with you. Uh, he felt afraid. It's, uh, he sees a lighted candle and held it to the picture. There's this sense of darkness there as well. There's dim light. It was some foul parody adjectives. Foul parody, some, uh, you know, he's taken, now down here where Dorian Gray removes the flower of his, from his coat, Dorian Gray usually goes out looking exquisite, but when, this is the equivalent, I think, of rolling up your sleeves, it's almost a hint of impending, which means upcoming violence, so it's symbolic. He's removing that aesthetic, aesthetic personality, persona, and he wants to put on a more violent, functional 
uh, attitude because he's about to do something quite violent. So, um, symbolic of imminent violence, that shedding of the aesthetic mask, and uh, it creates suspense as well. And finally, let's look at the idea of Dorian Gray crushing a flower. What does this mean? Who does Dorian want to crush in reality? So symbolically, he crushes a flower, but symbolically, so it uh, another piece of symbolism. Oscar Wilde would have made, uh, well, he did actually write plays. Um, his first play was 1896. 1894, he had commercial success with a woman of no importance. And um, so he almost creates this cinematic or play like structure in this scene. So this is symbolism. Um, towards Basil. And I think we will look at the violence towards Basil later because time is really getting on. Um, we'll do the revelation next time, I think. So let's jump back over to PowerPoint. I will leave you with the questions to get on with. And so uh, how does a wild create fear and tension in the scene? Write about gothic tropes, darkness, tone discomfort, repetition action, symbolism, use the pathetic fallacy, adjectives, and so on. If you are one of my students, simply list examples of fear and tension in the scene we've just covered. And finally, who in the novel represents Faust, the German scientist? who wants to see everything that man shouldn't see. See you again soon.